All right. So welcome to the last lecture of this semester. So this is uh, um, an emerging topic: uh, the hardware accelerators uh, for the machine learning or deep learning. And here we are going to discuss how the memory technologies can help uh, to build the machine learning accelerator. So this is also related to my research uh, in my group. Most of our research is on this topic. So as you know, so this artificial intelligence AI is very popular these days because it may enable many new applications. And uh, here are just a few examples. Uh, of course, everyone is talking about the self-driving the autonomous vehicle, and uh, it's happening uh, right now. And of course, the enabling technologies will be this like machine learning and uh, you see the cameras or sensors getting those data from the environment and then you need to do the real-time uh, processing and uh, uh, this, uh, the machine learning is very helpful and also the Google has this uh, translation uh, in the wireless headphone and uh, uh, this is also another application and for the biomedical applications of course the IBM is talking about replacing the doctors with the AI systems. So basically, they're trying to use the machine learning to uh, detect the features of this uh, biomedical images, images. So those are the applications. Of course, there are many, many applications beyond what I list here. Um, but the algorithms behind those applications are mostly driven by these neural networks. And there are various uh, types of the algorithms based on different kinds of neural networks. And here are some survey paper uh, to categorize the network topologies. And uh, uh, for example, here uh, we have this uh, fit forward networks. So here each node is a neuron and uh, between nodes are the synapses. So here are the fit forward uh, networks. So the data only go fit forward direction. And then there is a, one particular important subcategory of this fit forward network is this convolutional neural network, CNN, which is uh, very useful for the image or the video kind of uh, recognition. And uh, there are other uh, variants of this kind of uh, convolutional neural network. For example, the REST neural network, where you can bypass some of the nodes. And this is uh, was uh, invented by Microsoft back in 15, uh, the ResNet. And uh, then there are other topologies, uh, depending on how you connect those neurons. Uh, if you have the recurrent uh, connections. So this is the recurrent network, RNN. And uh, in particular, there is one type called the LSTM, long-term short-term memory. And this kind of RNN LSTM is good for the temporal data processing, for example, the speech uh, recognition, when you have the temporary data. So you need those kind of recurrent loop to help you. And there are new uh, networks, for example, the GAN, Generative Adversary Networks. This is to create two networks to compete with each other. And uh, then um, this one, you can use this one to generate some artificial fake images. So then you can use that to generate something uh, fake, but it looks real. So, so the goal is that those two networks, uh, the, the network cannot distinguish which is real and which is fake. So, so, so those are the uh, uh, different kinds of networks. And uh, 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 of course, uh, those are more machine learning in driven. And there is another type of the network, which is more biomedical, uh, no, bio, uh, physic, uh, biological driven. So, so those is the so-called spiky neural network. And uh, 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 there are uh, different kinds of uh, spiky neural network. Uh, available here, and uh, 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 there is uh, uh, so-called reservoir computing as well. So the liquid state machine is one example of this 
reservoir computing. I will not go into the deep, uh, details of those algorithms since there are many classes available in Georgia Tech if you want to take those uh, machine learning algorithms. I'm not expert on, on that either. So as a hardware designer, okay, what do we care about from the algorithm? So here we look at the size of the algorithm in terms of the number of parameters in the algorithm. So in the algorithm, um, we have those weights and the input and output uh, or intermediate data. So if you implement those algorithms on hardware, you need to care about how you store those data. And uh, 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 first, we need to look at how large is the model. And uh, here, we show the image net recognition, which is uh, the standard benchmark for image recognition. So there are like a thousand kind of classes of images and with millions of images uh, available. And the task is to identify uh, the image belongs to which class in this 1,000 category. And then the accuracy of this kind of recognition uh, and is, the, uh, is drawn here. And then with different kind of uh, number of layers in the network. And uh, 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 also here it shows the uh, uh, number of total parameters in the neural network model. As you can see here, as you go deeper of the network, you are going to improve the uh, accuracy, but the accuracy will tend to saturate eventually. And then uh, you have to increase the width of the network. That means you increase the number of uh, neurons per layer. And then you make the neural network uh, deeper and wider, and then you can improve the accuracy. Basically, you use more weights to learn the pattern or learn the features of your data set. And uh, uh, this is uh, uh, the challenge for the hardware design. That means you have to process so many data. And if you look at the state-of-the-art algorithms like those ResNet, so the number of parameters can be up to 100 million parameters. And uh, if for each parameter you use 8-bit fixed precision to store that parameter, that means 100 megabyte memory. And in many cases, I mean, if you look at GPU, they use floating point, 32-bit, 64-bit floating point, then you need even more capacity of the memory. But for uh, uh, our design, we prefer to use fixed point precision and uh, let's say 8-bit for each parameter, then you still need that 100 megabytes memory. So 100 megabytes, uh, if you think this number, maybe not that large, right? Because today's DRAM can be like a gigabyte easily. So th the problem is that you don't want the data to store in the DRAM. Because as you know, the DRAM latency and the, and the energy especially is huge when you access the data from the DRAM. Uh, so ideally, you want to <coughs> save those data on chip, uh, embedded those data with your logic. So you don't want to go to the DRAM, because the uh, DRAM, if you go to the DRAM, then the energy will be much higher than you get the data from SRAM cache on chip. So, so, so 100 megabyte cache is not available today, OK? Yeah, as you have learned the SRAN technology, the density is not there. Uh, uh, if you scale SRAN technology to 3 nanometer, 2 nanometer, 1 nanometer technology load, maybe you can reach that, but that will be like a few years later. And then at that time, maybe the neural network model become even larger. So, so, so uh, you, it's, it's like you are catching a running trend. So, so, so it's very difficult. So then people think about uh, uh, to use those emergent memories because potentially they have higher density than the S1. And uh, uh, the, this is active research these days. But for now, you cannot store, if you cannot store all of those ways on chip, you still have to use, use DRAM. This is exactly what you do today. Like GPU, I use GPU to train those network. And GPU is equipped with HBM. We talk about that, for example. Uh, the NVIDIA, uh, the, the Tesla uh, V100, P100 is equipped with a HBM 16, mega, uh, 16 gigabyte uh, a high bandwidth DRAM. 
So, so, so uh, you have to store data there. Okay, so this is the motivation for the hardware accelerator for AI. And uh, the, uh, the first application domain is this deep learning, the cloud. And uh, 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 as we see, the GPU is still dominating in this market. And uh, 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 but the recent trend is that uh, the industry is doing the uh, application specific IC, ASIC solutions uh, to replace the GPU. One example is Google's TPU. We are going to discuss in a few minutes. So this is to use a digital Mac uh, to specialize the computation uh, into this uh, digital circuit. So digital Mac is essentially multipliers and adders. And then uh, you are trying to uh, do this uh, neural network computations using those digital Mac. We are going to see that in a minute. And here we just code some numbers. Uh, to draw your attention, which is T ops per watt. So this is the metric people use to evaluate the accelerator design in terms of the energy efficiency. Uh, because this is a throughput, throughput <coughs> divided by power. So essentially it's the energy efficiency divided by power. T ox is tera operations per second. And then you divide it by power. This gives you the energy efficiency. So essentially, it's the number of operations uh, divided by the energy. And the uh, uh, GPU is uh, about 0.1 tera ops per watt. And the TPU can boost this to 1 tera ops per watt. So this is like a state of the art. And there's another application domain, which is IoT edge devices. Uh, so in this case, uh, people would prefer the smart sensing or smart processing capability as an edge device. Uh, for example, in your smartphone or the sense behind the sensor, you have some chip to do the real-time inference for you. And uh, uh, sometimes if you need to uh, get new data and update your model, you can also run that locally with your device without sending the data back to the cloud. So this can help with the privacy and security issue. So uh, uh, right now the, uh, uh, the, the normal uh, mode is that uh, when you get some data, right? Uh, for example, you ask uh, Google something, right? So it will send the uh, data back to the cloud and do the inference and then give you the answer, the prediction. And so uh, this, of course, heavily depends on the network. Uh, and then uh, and you are transparent. And you, uh, and that means you cannot protect your uh, uh, private data. So if you can have this kind of processing capability at your edge device, then you can improve your privacy, security, at the same time, you save the energy and power for the data communication through the wireless network, for example. So it's uh, very attractive if you can enable the inference or even sometimes transfer learning as your edge devices. Uh, so, so, so this is important uh, to enable those real-time operations uh, like those uh, autonomous vehicles. Right, you know, it's uh, uh, too slow to send the data back to the cloud and then uh, give you whether you should uh, stop in front of the traffic light. Right, so 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 you need to have this kind of capability at your edge device, and that means for hardware design you need to improve your throughput and uh, improve the energy efficiency because many edge devices are powered by battery. Right, so so you need to improve your energy efficiency. And here uh, we are interested in this uh, analog Mac. So we are going to use some analog computation to uh, do this uh, multiply and accumulate function, which is uh, heavily used in the network, neural network. So, so possibly you can use number of memory to do that. And here we are targeting at the energy efficiency, like uh, up to 100 teraops per watt. And there are some challenges associated with this analog computation because you are doing analog. Essentially, you are vulnerable to the process variation and the noise. 
and you know digital circuit is good because the very on and very off, right? One and zero. So so it's very immune to the noise and process variation. But when you do analog, then the noise and variation is always a concern. Excuse me, question. Can you say again why TQ has better energy efficiency? Uh, we are going to discuss TPU short, yeah, very quickly in the next few slides. So here is the energy efficiency of, for the accelerators, and uh, uh, here we show the energy efficiency versus the throughput of compute performance. And uh, here we have some data points from different uh, uh, chips, and uh, here depending on your power budget, the straight line here is your power budget of your chip. And uh, uh, here for the, this is from the, those uh, 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 companies. And uh, you can see that depending on your budget, like uh, you have talking about the uh, driving, then you may have like a budget of 10 watts. And then you can design your chips. And if you're talking about like uh, cloud, you can improve your budget to like 100 watts. And then you can do more computation. Uh, but the efficiency is roughly a limited to this one terawatt per watt. So there's a big gap between the human brain, which is the equivalent to be there. I don't know how to get it there, but uh, 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 the uh, uh, human brain power consumption is 20 watts. This is for sure. You just need to drink of a few cup of, uh, cup of coffee, right? <laughs> so, so, so 20 watts. And uh, you can, uh, I don't know how they get the equivalent of computation and, and performance. Um, but the efficiency is much higher, I would say. Yeah. Uh, if you look at the biological system. So there's a big gap. Uh, so the question is how we can do something to improve uh, the energy efficiency. So we get some inspirations from the neural network. I mean, bio biology, okay, neuroscience. Uh, so you know, in the you know, neural net, the biological network, uh, we have the neurons and the synapses. And synapses are connections between neurons. So mathematically, from the machine learning language, you will have that formula, right? So the input x is a vector, and then weights are like a matrix. So then you do this uh, input vector and the weight matrix multiplication, you get the weighted sum, uh, which is in this bracket. And then you go through the neural function, which is a nonlinear activation function, f. And uh, you can have sigmoid or ReLU. So then you get the output of the neural. And uh, uh, so this is uh, the principle uh, from the ma uh, machine learning uh, coding point of view. But for the hardware design, so if you look at this problem, so the conventional human architecture, we have a processor and the memory somehow separated. And you, you can say this is your DRAM, this is the data bus. And even on chip, you have your uh, computing unit and the cache. So it's like always the computing unit will get the data from the memory and do some computation. And then after the computation is done, then you send the data back. So you have a lot of data transfer in this process. So the uh, uh, neural network ideally should be like merged logic and the memory. Uh, because in the biologic system, it's like, like the neuron is doing some simple computation for you, like the thresholding or nonlinear function. And the memory are distributed right, in the uh, synaptic network. And the uh, synapses are carrying the uh, memory information. So when the network is evolving, learning, so the connections are changing. It's like the strength of the uh, connection between neurons are changing. It's like you are tuning the weight, uh, of the conductance of the uh, synapse. You can use the memory to store that information and change the memory and conductance. Then you are doing effective learning. So this is a high level of an energy. And uh, the idea is that we want to distribute the computation in this kind of uh, uh, network through the communication channel, neuron circuits, synaptic devices, and then you try to decentralize the computation. So this is the eventual goal. 
And uh, there are many approaches to do this neuromorphic uh, hardware. And uh, here I just uh, show different approaches. Uh, so you can use off-shelf uh, technology like GPU, FPGA, and uh, uh, you, can, you can use CMOS, silicon CMOS to do the ASIC, like Google TPU and the many accelerators from different groups. So this is uh, machine learning driven, and you can also use uh, number of memory to do that. And the another approach is the spiking neural network, which is more neuroscience driven. So in this case, uh, the designers are trying to build circuits to mimic the function of the neural net of the real neural network. So so like uh, IBM has true loss chip, and Intel is developing this Nohi chip. So this is to mimic the biological system more closely. And uh, 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 suppose the spiking version will have better energy efficiency, uh, but this is to be proven. Okay. Uh, uh, so 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 uh, there's still a lot of debate which one uh, has better efficiency. But I would say that uh, from the industry point of view, the machine learning, deep learning driven approach, and uh, 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 this TPU or, or this emerging number of memory is a mainstream. And these days, and if you look at the startup company, I think uh, there are like 100 companies working on this so-called AI chip. So it's essentially this business. So let's have a very brief introduction about the convolution neural, neural network. And uh, uh, here, this is a, a very simple example. And you have some input image, and then and you will have a few layers of the convolution and the pooling. Uh, and then this is to extract the features, like your edges or corners, uh, uh, through this convolution. And then eventually you are going to uh, uh, have a bunch of features uh, of this image. And then later you need to associate those features to the labels. This is a classification stage. So this is uh, done by the fully collected layer. So essentially you have those two stages feature extraction and the classification. And in the training uh, phase, so you are going to load in the training image, and this is supervised learning. So you know which label uh, is a correct label. So then um, after you do this fit forward pro uh, 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 process, you are going to get the predict label, and you compare the prediction with the true label. And uh, if they are wrong, then you are going to have arrows uh, between the true label and the prediction label. Then you are going to use that arrow to update uh, the weights uh, from the back to the front layers. So this is called the back propagation. And, uh, and then you, you, you need to do this iteratively through many images. And then the network can learn the features of this kind of data set. So this is the, the, the principle for the training. And after training is done, then you use it for inference. So in this case, the weights are already trained, are fixed. So then you just run the feed forward propagation, and then the output is your prediction. And then you want that prediction to be high, accurate, high accuracy. So if you look at this operation, so the most intensive computation will be the vector matrix multiplication. Uh, because the input from layer to layer, or input and output, essentially is a vector. And then the weight between layers essentially is a matrix. Of course, later we will see that uh, actually you have the uh, like a, a three-dimensional, four-dimensional tensor, right? So when you do the convolution. So, but eventually we need to, uh, 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 because you use memory, and uh, most memory technology are two-dimensional memory, right? So you need to unroll your four-dimensional tensor into two-dimensional matrix, and then you store that in your memory array. OK, so we don't have too much time today. Um, I'd like to stop here, and uh, uh, then next uh, class, we're going to have more discussions uh, on the Google's TPU and uh, my research uh, projects.